so I have the pleasure of introducing Chantal Thompson to you. Um, she's a um, professor of French at Brigham Young University, which you probably already know that, um, where she does many, many things. <laughs> she is the coordinator of the first year classes and the director, the founding director of the African Studies program at Brigham Young. And she teaches Francophone African uh, literature and culture classes in the upper division and upper division language courses. And she takes students to um, study abroad programs in Senegal. And she has many, many awards. You can look at the bio that was circulated and see all of those. She's a certified actful tester and also an actful trainer and is, I think, involved in all of the um, revisions and postings of, of um, the actual guidelines in French for all of the skill areas. So the encyclopedia of yeah. <laughs> knowledge. And um, she's also the um, author of three uh, well-respected textbooks in French, Maybe, Moment Littéraire and Ensuite. And um, I better stop there. There won't be time for the rest of the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm, uh, this is only two hours. So it's a very small introduction to uh, looking at languages through the lens of proficiency. But I hope it will whet your appetite and that you will want to know more and uh, that this will give you already a few ideas that you can uh, apply, use tomorrow in your classroom. Okay, so through the lens of proficiency, a fresh look at foreign language assessment and instruction. Okay, I'm going to start with a quiz. So uh, you have one minute to discuss with your neighbor what the difference is between those three words. Okay, so, so um, some very simple ways to remember those terms. Proficiency is what you can do with the language in unrehearsed situations mm -hmm. and in an unlimited range of contexts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you can do with the language in real life. Performance is what you can do with the language within a limited context. So if you're in chapter five, you can do things related to chapter five. Uh, they're both doing things with the language. Okay? But proficiency is unrehearsed and unlimited. Performance is limited and curriculum based. Achievement is what you know about the language. And would you say that most of the academic tests that we're familiar with are proficiency, performance, or achievement? Achievement. Yeah. An example, OK? Um, my granddaughter has had five years of French in high school. She can conjugate verbs in any tense you want, even the past subjunctive, which she will never use. But she can't do anything when she goes to France. She, yes, triste, OK? So, uh, and we have hundreds of thousands of students in that situation, not just in the US, but everywhere, all over the world. People who know a lot about the language, who can get 100% on an achievement test, but who can't do anything with it. Okay, So how do we get students to be more proficient in the language? We don't want just achievers who can fill in the blank and know about the language. We want them doing things with the language. So very briefly, basic principles of proficiency assessment. How many of you have had training in uh, OPI testing or, OK, so, OK, a few of you. How many of you know the actual scale? You know of the actual scale? Of, of OK. Um, but 
there are many misconceptions out there about the actual scale because I get this all the time. I say, oh, my intermediate level students, oh yeah, they're advanced. Oh, absolutely, they're advanced. <laughs> and I say, I doubt it. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's make sure that we're on the same page. Take your handout, page one, okay? And let's see if you can do this. We're gonna do it together for the sake of time. All right, let's, uh, and since my pointer doesn't work on this screen, okay, uh, let's imagine that I am pointing to function for novice. What is, <laughs> it's is, it's not R, what is the function for novice? What can they do? Our beginners, our true be beginners. Yeah? They can uh, produce memorized material, okay, and list, list, okay, food items, clothes, okay, they can list. That's their comfort zone. Content is what? What do they talk about? Yeah, uh, themselves and their immediate surroundings, okay, what's in this room and uh, what food do I like to eat, okay. Accuracy, what kind of interlocutor do you have to be? It helps to be a language teacher because language teachers are super sympathetic. We understand things that nobody else does, don't we? <laughs> yeah, they can start a sentence and we know what they're going to say and we can finish the sentence for them. Okay, so super sympathetic. Text type words or memorized chunks, phrases, okay? Intermediate, and everybody starts as a novice, okay? So intermediate, what can they do? Ask and answer questions? What's the main one? Well, that's text type. That's text, no, they can't narrate yet. They can create with the language. What does that mean, create? Well, but that's text type. What's create with the language? Okay, combine, adapt, learn material to express personal meaning. That's what create means. Okay, memorize material for novice, but create for intermediate. Ask and answer questions, and the third one for intermediate. Handle simple survival, survival situations, such as ordering a meal in a restaurant, getting a hotel room, uh, simple transactions. Okay, so what's their content? Context and content. Intermediate. Intermediate. A lot of everyday and a lot of the me world. Intermediate. Okay. I can talk about my interest, my school, my family, my house, okay, me. And uh, accuracy, do you still have to be sympathetic? Yes, <laughs> you need to, okay, because uh, you have to fill in the blanks a lot of the time. And text type, sentences or strings of sentences, okay. Uh, advanced, what are the functions? Now you can say it. Narrate and describe in present, past, and future times. And those of us who teach European languages, we know how much of a challenge that is for our students, especially narration description in the past. Okay? It's a bear for um, French, Spanish, Italian, several languages. Okay? So describe, narrate, in present, past, and future times, and? No, that was intermediate. The what? Well, reporting is part of describing or narrating. Reporting is going to involve both. 
handle situations with complications. E example, okay, I've witnessed a car accident. I have to call the police. I don't know the car vocabulary. I don't know the injury vocabulary. If I'm truly advanced, it's not going to matter. I'm going to be able to circumlocute, deal with complications, and get my message across without my language falling apart. If I am not truly advanced, as I try to focus on unknown vocabulary, then all of a sudden I start making all kinds of mistakes that I was not making before, such as agreement, verb, subject. Okay? Uh, for some strange reason, that's the first thing to go with uh, people who are not truly advanced. First thing to go. Okay, so those are the functions. Content, context. Is this still the me world? No. Community, the world around me. Okay, but it's still concrete. Okay, so I can tell you what happened uh, on November 4th and how the Republicans uh, took over the Senate. I can uh, speak concretely about what happened. But it's a totally different thing if you ask me my opinion about the gridlock in Washington. Uh, how is this going to affect the gridlock in Washington? Are we going to see any change in that gridlock as a result of these elections? Then I would have to give my opinion, maybe hypothesize, if the Republicans do this, if Obama does that, okay, imagine uh, hypotheses. Okay, so that would be superior. Content, uh, the world around me. Accuracy, do I need to be a sympathetic interlocutor with advanced? No. The native speaker doesn't have any problem understanding. Okay, and text type, what is the text type? Paragraphs, connected discourse. And where is the biggest problem? Where do, do we fail in academia? The transition from intermediate to advanced. Okay, the transition from intermediate to advanced. We have students who plateau forever at intermediate. How do we get them to go beyond that intermediate, mid, intermediate, high plateau? So we're going to talk about that, okay? So for those of you who are visual learners, just a, a few snapshots of what it means to be a novice, okay? You're a parrot, okay? Intermediate, I love that picture for intermediate because intermediate is willing to take risks. And when you take risks, you crash. But it's okay. You pick yourself back up. See, novices like to stay in their comfort zone. They're afraid to come out of their comfort zone. And that's why we have so many students who stay at novice for too long, because they're afraid to take risks and they're penalized for taking the risks. So we're going to talk about that too. Okay? But you're not afraid to take a risk. You create, you combine, you adapt, you express personal meaning. Mistakes and all. Okay? Advanced. You've got the fluency of a native speaker, okay? You're a full conversational partner. You speak with confidence. You can initiate. The uh, intermediate is mostly reactive, okay? You ask me a question, I answer. You ask me another question, I answer. Advanced, you initiate. You narrate, describe in all time frames. You handle situations with a complication, okay? Superior, we won't talk about superior very much because we don't see these guys, okay? <laughs> Uh, even uh, a lot of our graduate students across this country are not superior. So uh, superior is able to support opinions, hypothesize about abstract topics with no patterns of errors. And another level was uh, added in 2012 to the actual guidelines. What is it called? Distinguished. Distinguished. Okay which would correspond to levels four and five on the ILR scale, okay? So, since we are going to uh, learn how to set uh, learning uh, targets, uh, learning outcomes, we need to know what the low, mid, and high represent, okay? Uh, novice, intermediate, and advanced all have low, mid, and high. So, low, what is it? 
It's when you can do all the functions of the level, but barely. You're hanging by your fingernails, okay? So if you're intermediate low, you can create with the language in the present, you can ask questions, you can handle survival situations, but it's always the same four or five verbs that keep coming back. It's very limited vocabulary, there are quite a few mistakes, but you sustain sentence level speech through it all, okay? Barely. Mid, solid, okay? I'm going very fast through this because I, uh, I think you're getting the picture, okay? Then high is the fallen angel. So intermediate high is going to be someone who is performing at the advanced level most of the time, more than half of the time. But there are patterns of breakdown. A typical pattern of breakdown in European languages would be with narration description in the past, for example, where you have someone who has the text type of advanced, who is very fluent, but while narrating in the past, we'll have past, 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 present. Past, 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 present. And they keep doing it. It's a pattern. Okay, so that will make them intermediate high versus advanced low. Okay, so the fallen angels for the high. Okay, so novice, what are the functions? Or what is the function for novice? Just, uh, I'm repeating this on purpose at the risk of sounding like a broken record. Okay. Okay, list. All right. And text type is? Words. Okay, intermediate. What are the three things? Create with a language. Ask and answer. And simple survival situations. Okay, uh, what's the text type? Sentences or strings of sentences. Advanced, what are the functions? Narrate, describe, and handle complications. Okay, and what is the difference between narration and description? Yeah, some languages, some Asian languages do not have tenses. You have time markers. Okay, so... Uh, which one answers the question, how were things? Description. And what happened? Narration. Narration. That is the huge problem for our students. The difference between the two. Okay. So superior, I won't uh, dwell on it. Okay. What's the most, and you have this on your uh, handouts. Okay. I hope you're using this to take notes. What's the most important part of that trait? And, and this is what we need to think about every day as we listen to our students. I honestly think about that, those assessment criteria every time I listen to my students. Okay, so the number one thing is going to be functions. Because everything else on that tree serves function. For example, if I'm learning adjectives, why do I need adjectives? So that I can either create with the language or describe. Okay, so uh, if I'm learning uh, the passé composé, why do I need it? So I can narrate in the past. Everything in language serves function. Why do I need vocabulary of the house? So that I can describe my house. Okay, so um, I won't go through the list of uh, functions, but just like in a tree, the rings in the trunk tell you the value of the tree, the tasks that our students can perform. That tells us their level, okay? Now, functions are rooted in content and contexts. So what's the difference? Yeah, you've got to have something to talk about, right? But so, so what's the difference? Uh-huh. Okay, all right. Um, let's say that I'm uh, to keep to stay with that uh, context. Let's say that I am in Germany and my German is very novice, low. Okay, I'm in Germany and I'm ordering uh, food from a restaurant. So I look for cognates and I see tomato zuppen and so, oh yeah, I recognize that. Okay, so. Uh, 
I'm, I'm able to handle it with cognates. But let's say that my tomato soup comes with a long hair in it. <laughs> has the context changed? The context has changed because now I need more language to explain what my problem is and that I want another bowl of soup and I don't want to keep that one and et cetera. Okay, so the context determines the level of language that you need. Okay, now accuracy. What, um, what are the components of accuracy? They're the leaves, the most visible part of the tree. In the fall, your leaves are beautiful right now. I hear they were even more beautiful a week ago, but they're still beautiful. So what, uh, what is accuracy? What is involved in that? Grammar. Okay, grammar, and a good way to uh, visualize grammar to me is uh, Ted Higgs' definition. Uh, Ted Higgs has written a lot of articles on grammar and proficiency. And he says that grammar is the mortar between the bricks. And I like that. Because when you are novice, you're just piling up bricks. And you kick it and, you know, and then it's gone. But when you put verbs and articles and prepositions and adjectives with those words, then they start holding together, you're building something. So you cannot become even novice high without grammar. Okay, so grammar is important. It's part of accuracy and we'll put syntax with grammar. What else? There are six factors. What did you say? Pronunciation, pronunciation absolutely. Okay, pronunciation, what else? Vocabulary and uh, languages that have gender or cases, that's going to be a big problem. Okay, what else? <coughs> Three more. Cultural yeah, sociocultural uh, appropriateness. Okay, well, the kind of register to use and what context and all the cultural code. Okay, what else? Two more. Part of accuracy. Fluency is part of accuracy. Okay, if I'm novice, I have none. As I move up the scale, I develop more and more fluency. Okay, would it be accurate for me today in this context to, um, to, to search for my words all the time? No. So you expect a certain level of fluency from me. Okay, so it's part of accuracy as you move up the scale. And finally, okay, pragmatic competence. And pragmatic competence, what is that? You mentioned registry. And that would be sociolinguistic. Okay, it's the strategies that we use in any language, in L1 too. Do you, when you take your car to the mechanic, do you know all the vocabulary? for the engines? No. But so you use circumlocution. That's a strategy. Pause fillers are a strategy. All the strategies that we use in real life, that's pragmatic competence. So all of that is part of accuracy. But you see that accuracy is only part of the whole picture. So grammar, pronunciation, and vocabulary, which are probably the three elements that we spent a lot of time on, there are only three elements of one of the assessment criteria. Okay, the most telling indication of the level of your students is going to be text type. What is text type? And our textbooks do not address text type. They do not. What is text type? For novice? Words? Intermediate? Sentences? The, or strings of sentences? Then? Paragraphs. And for superior? Extended discourse. Tell me if this is a string of sentences or a paragraph. Okay, let's suppose that you've asked me what I did last summer. Okay, and this is the truth. My husband and I went to Peru. 
it was on uh, our bucket list. We finally did it. We went to uh, Machu Picchu. We went to Lake Titicaca. The altitude was a problem for my husband. 14,000 feet. He had a hard time breathing. Several people in our group had a hard time breathing at 14,000 feet. He had to buy a little canister of oxygen. I didn't have any problem. OK. OK. What uh, text type was that? String of sentences. Would that qualify for advance? So a lot of times what happens in our classroom, we mistake strings of sentences for paragraph level speech. Oh yeah, my students are speaking in paragraphs. Not really. Not really. Are we giving them the tools to go from strings of sentences to connected discourse? Okay, so text type is the number one indicator. When I, uh, when I go observe my teaching assistants, Okay, the first thing I notice when I listen to the students is text type. Just last week, I was observing a class taught by one of our more experienced graduate assistants. She knew I was coming. She had prepared a really good lesson. She had that class moving from beginning to end. It was, there was a lot of energy. The students were sitting on the edge of their seats. She thought she had done a wonderful job. But what did she do? It was the chapter on food. And it was the third day for all that massive vocabulary. And so she had beautiful PowerPoint slides on all the food items. What is it? What is it? What is it? Then uh, get together with a partner and list, make a list of all the um, foods you like to eat for breakfast. Okay, then reports. Uh, change partners, make a list of the foods you like to eat for lunch. Change partners, make a list of all the foods you like to eat for dinner. And on and on and on. And at the end of the 50 minutes, I asked her, what was the text type? of every one of your activities today. And her face just fell because she hadn't thought about it. She was really well prepared, but she had not thought about text type. Every one of her activities for 50 minutes was at the word level. What was she doing? Perpetuating novice mid. I went to another section of the same level, 101, your 1010, at the next hour. In that class, the teacher was giving tasks that were at the intermediate level, constantly. And the level of performance of those students was intermediate low. What made the difference? The text type of the tasks that the teacher was assigning. Do we think about text type when we design our tasks, when we listen to our students? It's your number one indicator of the level of your students. Okay, so that's the whole picture. And uh, when we uh, look at each level, Okay, what's the difference between novice mid, uh, novice low and novice mid? Okay, low is 15 to 20 words, honestly. You can be novice low in any language in a couple of weeks. But you know what? <coughs> there are a lot of students, hundreds of thousands of students in this country and other countries. It's all over the world who after three and four years of language, are still novice low. They can do well on an achievement test, but they can't do anything with the language. Okay, mid, 
you remember what was the key word? Mid was solid, if you can be solid with words. Okay, but uh, you can start creating with the language, but your comfort zone is the word. Hi, what does it mean? Remember the visual? The fallen angel most of the time at the, at the intermediate level, but cannot sustain. Okay, intermediate, low, can they do all of that? Can they do all of that? Yes, they can, otherwise they wouldn't be intermediate. But barely, barely. Okay, mid, can they do all of that? Solid, exactly. Okay, with some peaks into advanced. And high, the fallen angel from advanced. Okay. So uh, low, can they do all of this? Advanced low? Yes, but barely. In European languages, one of the big telling signs is going to be um, their ability to distinguish between the narrative mode and the descriptive mode. They will stay in the past, but they don't know how to make the difference consistently between descriptive and narrative, and their vocabulary is not as rich. Okay. Mid is solid with some peaks into superior. High is superior more than half of the time. Do you know where um, graduate, graduating majors in the uh, commonly taught languages are when they finish school in, uh, in the US? There was a, an actual study to see the level of graduating majors. Okay. Yeah, and what was the, per the percentage? More of what? No? 53% are intermediate, high, or lower. 47 are advanced, low, or higher. So can we do a better job? And for uh, less commonly taught languages or Chinese, Arabic, it's going to be intermediate high as, a, as opposed to advanced low. But uh, can we do a better job of bringing our students to higher levels of proficiency? Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. So, okay, and I think this is an excellent example of the difference between paragraph level speech and sentence level speech. In blue, the young fellow who comes to get my neighbor every morning has a red truck with a powerful engine and extra large tires. Probably because it's so old, the engine makes a dreadful noise like thunder and wakes up the whole neighborhood. Are you getting the whole picture? You're getting the picture of this truck. That's advanced. Okay, the bottom one. He has a red car, it's very big with big tires, it's very old too, it makes a lot of noise. Are you getting the picture of that truck? You're much less, much less. You have to use your imagination a lot. Okay, so that's the difference. Are we bringing our students from that example in the bottom to that paragraph uh, level speech? Uh, here, ideally, if I had the time, I would show you some examples of uh, intermediate, high, advanced, low, and I would have you identify what it is. But just from those uh, three little segments that you saw, and this refers to your, um, your handout on page two, okay? Uh, no, page three, okay, page three, okay? Role of the teacher in a proficiency-based classroom, just like in an interview, what is the role of the teacher? Facilitator. That's the best, the best name for it, okay? Guide on the side, not sage on the stage, okay? It's a very interesting exercise when you come out of a class to think, ah, what was the ratio today between teacher speech and student speech? Very revealing. Okay, and what did you see in those little snippets of uh, teacher behaviors and techniques that, uh, and I can disconnect the sound now, okay, that uh, apply to the classroom? What kind of questions were those testers asking? 
Did you notice? Tell me about this. Tell me about that. Tell me about a typical day. Tell me about your educational background. Why are those polite requests used so much in an interview? And what is their potential in the classroom? Comfortable? No, a lot of students are not going to be comfortable with them. They prefer, for example, instead of tell me about a typical day, they're going to, they're going to prefer how many classes do you have each day? They're open-ended. They're open-ended. And that's another very revealing exercise when you come out of class. Analyze the types of questions that you asked. How many were closed? How many were open-ended? Uh, Elaine Horowitz at the University of Texas, Austin, has done a lot of studies on the questions that language teachers ask. And guess what she's found? That closed questions are the staple of the language classroom. Why do you think we do that? Sometimes we don't even notice it. Why do we do that? Okay. What else? It narrows the field for the kids. For the yeah. Students. Okay. It's easier for them. It, absolutely. It's easier for them. It's qualitative. And I think that's one of the biggest factors because we want to cover so much mm -hmm. that we've got to run through the material and we can control the time better if we've got closed questions. But do our students move up the scale with closed questions? Watch for the questions that you ask. Okay? And also, good questions, not only are they open-ended, but they target functions. If I ask, oh, you went to Madrid last summer? Uh, what did you do in Madrid? What function am I after? But what, that's a text type. What it's function am I after? And it's going to turn, out, to turn out to be, okay? Because I think I'm asking for narration in the past, but I'm not going to get narration in the past with that question. How do I need to change that question to get narration in the past? Tell me about a specific experience that you had in Madrid. Tell me about your first day in Madrid. Tell me about your last day in Madrid. Tell me about uh, a day you met someone in Madrid. That can be told as a story. But what did you do in Madrid? Hmm. I went to the Prado. I went here. I went there. <laughs> okay. You're not going to get narration in the past. So are, are questions open-ended? Are they targeting function? Okay. And what else did you notice? Did you notice that uh, Guadalupe, the third one, she, uh, she was hoping that the tester was going to ask more questions. Did you notice that? The third one. And, and the tester said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Silence. Yes. So, um, if we said, um, "Tell me a story," as opposed to "Tell me a story about something that happened in Madrid," as opposed to "Tell me about," um, tell me what you. If you story. mention the word "story," it may not uh, register with most students. But if you say, "Tell me about something specific that happened on that first day." then they're going to give you the story. But the story, the word story itself is not necessarily going to trigger a story. So um, when, when I was talking about the mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that was one of the major lessons I learned from my initial OPI tester training. That was in 1985. That was one of the first ones. <laughs> Okay, that's <laughs> how long I've been around. But I, I, 
came out of that workshop a changed person. I went back to my classroom the following Monday. I was a different person. And one of the first things that changed for me was the role of silence. I was one that was so conscious of the 50 minutes. Oh, I only have 50 minutes. You know, I can't, I can't wait for Susan to uh, take five minutes to come out with an answer. Okay. You've got to allow silence. Otherwise, how are they going to take risks? Got to allow silence. And uh, in an interview, you've got four phases, okay, or faces, okay. You start with, oh, tell uh, how you doing, small talk, okay. Then level checks, what can they do in a sustained fashion? Probes, they start breaking down back and forth between what they can do, what they can't do, and then back to the comfort zone at the end. How could that be the four phases of a class period? This. Absolutely. Okay. What class do you have before this? Oh, what uh, what are you studying right now in that class? Okay. Then level checks. What would that be? Okay. That that would be part of the warm up, the presenting the objectives. It's. How we doing from whatever we did yesterday? The review. Absolutely. The review, okay, solidifying the, the floor. Then probes would be what? Well, uh, no, you can have open-ended in the level checks, okay, but <coughs> probes, it's the new stuff. But what happens between probes and level checks, back and forth, between the new material, the old, the, old, the new, the old? What happens in a lot of our classrooms? We hit them all at once with the new material and we stay there. Then the level of frustration is very high. So are we doing this back and forth thing and then back to the comfort zone before the bell rings? Okay, then the tree. Are we thinking about the tree when we go into class? Are we asking ourselves, okay, what function does this serve? Why am I teaching this? What function does it serve? Do I give them, am I giving them enough functional practice? That's what's going to determine. And then what text type am I hearing? What level of accuracy? And then this is, and you have this on page three. To me, it's one of the most important visuals that you're going to see today. Okay? Because if our focus is one on, on what students can do with the language, not what they know about, but what they can do with it, then we're going to change from this to that. This is the traditional approach. Okay? Let's say in chapter three, I cover, and that's an interesting term in itself, okay? I cover interrogative pronouns. Okay. So they're doing well on the quizzes, they do well on the achievement test, I feel good about it, we really covered it well, and I move on. And I cover something else, I, they do well on the achievement test, I assume they know it, and I move on. What am I building with that model? <laughs> the Tower of Babel. You know what happened to that tower? You know what happened to that tower, okay? Whereas the proficiency model is, okay, let's say that I'm in chapter three, interrogative pronouns. So I ask myself, what function does it serve? What function does it serve? Okay, so I observe them while they are doing group work, asking each other questions, and what do I observe? That they're still making quite a few mistakes. When it's a fill-in-the-blank quiz, they do pretty well, but when they are actually using it, they're still making mistakes. So, during chapter four, even though there is nothing in chapter four on questions, what do I do? I take it upon myself to recycle the function of asking questions. And can you recycle that function in any chapter? Absolutely. Okay, so I recycle the function of asking questions in chapter four, 
in chapter 5 until chapter 6, I observe that they're doing well. But what happens if we just follow the textbook? We've got questions here, and we've got no questions here, and we've got no questions here. It's the teacher always doing the asking. And we have a lot of intermediate level students who have trouble asking questions. And we're not thinking, OK, what function does it serve? How do I recycle that function? Okay, So this is profound. This is very profound. You have it on page 4. Okay, Very profound. Function determines how content is handled. What does that mean to you? Function determines how content is handled. Okay. All right. Okay. What else? You could talk about freely, for instance, with any of the functions. Uh -huh. If our, as instructors, our job is to make sure that we are aiming at those other, at, at the higher level. Not too high, not two levels right, up, no, it's but be one level up. Yes. I plus ones. You yeah. Know, right. Okay, all right, let's say that I am teaching um, a fourth semester class where I start introducing literature. And my function is narration description in the past. So how do I ask my questions on Madame Bovary or my literary passage. How do I ask my questions in the past? See, most, most of the time we're used to discussing literature in the present. And that's one of the problems why our students, when they go into the upper division content courses, they stagnate at the intermediate level because they don't get that much practice narrating, describing in the past, which is the biggest problem of the French language. But if, as my functional focus, I have narration, description in the past for half the semester during my fourth semester class, then all the tasks are going to be eliciting narration, description in the past. And they get so much practice doing narration description in the past that they are moving up the scale. Okay, another thing. You look at a lot of intermediate level texts in all languages. Okay, and you look at the chapter on the chapter in the singular on the past. One chapter out of 12. In the grammar section and the follow-up, the exercises are on the past. But then there is, for example, uh, a film excerpt. And the questions are in the present. There is a cultural reading, and the questions are in the present. There is a literature passage and the questions are in the present. And that was the chapter on the past. So what do you have to do as an instructor? You have to ask yourself, OK, what function are we working on? How do I get them to practice that function? Function determines how content is handled. If my function is asking questions, then in their reading an article, then I'm not going to ask them any questions on the article. They have to produce the questions on the article. 
function determines how content is handled. Then you have to have content to make language relevant. How many of you uh, teach the advanced grammar class? Or you've had an advanced grammar class? Everybody's had the advanced grammar class, right? Okay. Is there much content in it? No? It can be. But you look at the textbooks available, it's usually pretty dry. And it's also sentence level activities. An oxymoron, if, you're th if you think about it. Okay? So you, you have to bring in the films, you have to bring in the short stories, you got to bring in the content, because what do you talk about? Okay? And then you have to do language to make content meaningful. That's for the upper division uh, content classes. See, in, in most programs, what happens? You do language until the third year, right? Then you go into the fourth year content course, courses and you no longer do language because that was supposed to have been done, right? But where are the students? There are still a lot of intermediate highs in there. Do they need help? Are we addressing language while we're doing content? Very profound. Okay, and then you have to target reasonable degrees of control. And uh, I will explain. We can teach different things for different degrees of control. Uh, conceptual control is when you, the first time you teach anything. Okay, the first time you teach the passé composé, the preterite, okay, you learn, okay, there is an auxiliary verb, there is an, a, a past participle, this is how it works. I can get 100% on an achievement test with conceptual control. Okay, but... Does that mean that I can use it in real life? No. Okay. And what is it that we leave out in academia? Is the partial control phase where we reward the risk taking, where we reward the people who take the chance at saying more but with mistakes. And I, we're going to do a little activity on that. Full control, it's easy to understand what it is. It's when you've done enough practice and enough context that it comes naturally. You don't even have to think about it. Learning becomes acquisition. Okay? All right. So now on page four, we're going to do this activity. Okay? Let's say we've got a group of students who are primarily novice mid. So first, first semester and uh, early in the first semester. Okay, and this is the task, listing clothing items to pack for a trip. What level is that task? Novice. So they're novice mid. Novice mid means what? Novice. Solid. Okay, so what degree of control can I reasonably target? Full. Implications for grading. Everything counts. Every mistake counts. Okay. Now, I've got a group that's primarily novice high. And the task is asking questions of a visiting celebrity for a newspaper article. What degree of control can I reasonably expect? Partial. Because it's an intermediate level task and then they're, they're not there yet. Okay, all right, listen to this. Who gets the better grade? The student who asks four little baby questions that are perfect, or the student who asks 10 relevant questions with a few mistakes? Is it really what happens? Is it really what happens? Because if it were really what happens, then why would so many of our students still fear taking risks? Because they've been rewarded for not taking risks. Mm -hmm. 
solve the first part. And you tell them, if you answer this minimally, everything better be correct. If you say more, and you communicate more, then you have leeway. With the That's answer. great. That's great. Yeah, that's and, it, and it works. And you have to be very explicit about it. And what we tell them is that if your answer is absolutely correct but minimal, you get 15 out of 20. That is not an A. In order to get the A, you have to go beyond the bare minimal answers and you have to give details, you have to use connectors, you have to and we explain what the criteria are. Okay? But if we don't reward them for taking the risks, then what are they going to do? Stick to their safe zone. It makes a huge difference. Okay, now I've got a group of mostly intermediate mid students. Okay, what are you seeing? You're seeing solid with creating with the language, asking and answering questions. Okay, so same task, asking questions of a visiting celebrity. What do I expect now? Full. What does that imply? What does that imply? It implies that every mistake counts. You see how I move them up on the accuracy scale? Every mistake counts now. Okay, now, same group of students, intermediate, mid. Now, the task narrating in the past, a memorable vacation. Absolutely. I, I even put emerging in between conceptual and partial. So, who gets the better grade? The one who writes four lines with no mistakes of little baby sentences? Or the one who writes an actual paragraph with evidence of connectors? but a few mistakes. It's, is it really happening? Is it really happening? Okay, and we look at signs of elaboration just as much as we look at past verbs. And we tell them that in advance. Okay, all right, so I've put on, the, uh, on the, the agenda that I'm going to talk about three things that are applications, implications of, uh, of what we just talked about. And the number one is, and good, we have 45 minutes, that's good. Okay, key number one is course design. Course design that integrates function, content, accuracy, and text type. All right, whenever I design a course, no matter what the level, it can be first year, second year, third year, content course, doesn't matter. This is the model. If I could point, I would highlight the middle column. Functions and text type are your core, okay? Because that's going to determine how I handle my content and which language forms I need to teach or review. Okay, so what I have on page five is um, a syllabus or the skeleton for the syllabus for a fourth semester class. Okay, what we call 202 in our, in our uh, curriculum, okay, and it's the fourth semester. We get a lot of the AP students who come directly into that, and then we get our own students who uh, have done 101, 102, 201, and we also get people from, uh, who transfer from junior colleges and so forth. So we've got uh, a varied uh, audience there, okay, but most of them are intermediate mid when they begin. I want them to be intermediate high or as close as possible to intermediate high. Okay, so what am I going to do to start? I start with the core function. Okay, they're able to create with the language in the present pretty solidly. 
So I'm going to start with the present, but what is the advanced dimension that I'm adding? What is it? Elaboration. I'm going from create to describe and narrate. So degree of control. Partial. I know that I'm going to hear a lot of strings of sentences still. Okay, but that's my function and text type. I am working towards connected discourse in the present. So, let's say that I'm doing literature as my content. All my tasks are in what time frame? In the present. Okay, so what are the mistakes they're still making? Do they still make mistakes in verbs in the present? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, do they still make mistakes on nouns and articles? Oh, yes. Okay, they still make mistakes on articles at the advanced level. Okay. So I definitely need to uh, recycle nouns and articles. Do they still make mistakes on adjectives? Oh, yes. Adverbs? Oh, yes. Okay, so I'm going to really work on that while I am studying these literary texts and giving them tasks in, the in the present. And I'm going to work on tools for elaboration. I will show you how in a minute. Okay? then we're going to really work on vocabulary because we, you cannot go from intermediate to advanced without significant increase in vocabulary. Okay? So about how much of my time in a 15-week semester am I going to spend on describe and narrate in present? About how much? Two, three weeks. Yeah. I'm going to spend a good two to three weeks just in the present. Okay. And I'm not throwing in the past or uh, structures that serve higher functions. I'm just working on description, narration in the present, but adding the text type of advanced. Okay, then I'm going to do a couple of classes on ask and answer questions to make sure that that's solid. Okay, so for example, when we're reading uh, Les Lettres Persanes, an excerpt from Les Lettres Persanes by Montesquieu uh, with this Persian who comes to Paris, say, so, oh, that's strange. Why are, we there? What are, why are they doing this like this? Okay, then they're going to be asking all kinds of questions. They're going to imagine, okay, you're in Charlottesville for the first time. You come from another planet. What kind of questions do you have? Okay, so we work on questions, interrogative pronouns, negative expressions, more vocabulary. Degree of control? No, that's full. That's full. Okay, now I'm going to move into the bear. Describe, narrate in the past. They have a lot of trouble with that. Okay, problem. There's only one chapter in the book on that. So what do I have to do on the grammar book? I know. I know. So why, why do you think they're having trouble? Okay. In uh, Asian languages, you don't have tenses, you have time markers, but they're still having trouble with, uh, with... Oh, you do? Oh, you do. Right. Yes. It's not that hard. Okay. But you have other problems. 
you have other problems. And elaborating with the text type of advanced is going to be a huge hurdle. Okay? Why is it so hard in French and Spanish and Portuguese and Italian? The narrative and the descriptive mode. They're not used to that. That's number one. Yeah. In English, it's mainly, it's just one. I mean, you have some, I was doing this when this happened. But it's very minimal. So the, and the formation of the past tenses in those languages is very complex for students. So verb formation and deciding between narrative mode and descriptive mode. Very complex. Yes? So this is something I've been thinking about along with this. And I, I will say up front that I'm um, decidedly on the side of implicit acquisition as opposed to learning. Right. Um, and Part of what I see as a difficulty here is framing it in such a way that we start with, here are the rules for how you form the empire. No, 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 no. Exactly. So that's, no, that's, that's, that's not how we do it. Right. No, that's what I would want. But the, yeah. when, you, when, when you say um, the, you know, how they're formed this is, and it's complex, that makes me think about teaching it for learning as opposed to no. No, you can have them infer from the input, you know, uh, when you use which and how it is formed and so forth. As, as, I mean, the more they use their cognitive skills and their higher, their higher order learning skills, the better. Okay, so it's, but why do they make so many mistakes? That's why. That I was just saying, it's complex in the verb formation, it's complex in the choice of mode. And so you compound that and so how do you teach it? Yes, I totally agree. I totally agree. Okay, uh, there are natural ways to teach it. Okay, but we do need to focus on it. Okay, because uh, if it's just in passing that uh, and they don't notice, okay, well why is it imperfect here? And uh, they do need to see it. So we have to add a lot more practice because the book doesn't give us enough practice to last as long as we want to stay on that function. Lots more practice and tools for elaboration, which I will show you. Okay? But in that course, fourth semester, how much time will I want to spend for French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese? Okay, how much time will I want to spend on that function? Describe, narrate in the past. About half of the semester. I'm not kidding. About half of the semester. Because that's where they fall. Oh, yes. Easy. Okay. And so, um, as, oops, well, okay. Uh, I do a lot of recycling. I spend a little time on narrate, describe in the future. Uh, but I find that they don't have that much trouble with it. So I don't spend that much time on it. And I do some expressing, defending opinion and making hypotheses, but I don't spend that much time on it. I come back to describing, narrating in present and past with connected discourse. Because how would I work on the superior... Uh, structures that work that serve superior functions if they're not yet at the advanced level. And if you think about it, okay, that's one of my pet peeves. Think about how much time we spend at the end of first year on if clauses. Mm -hmm. What function does the conditional serve and the if clauses? What function is that? Hypothesis. Okay, what are we trying to do at the end of first year? Bring them from intermediate low to intermediate mid, or novice high to not to intermediate low. Do we need to bring in that distractor of conditional if clauses, the subjunctive? What about double pronouns? 
Do you need that to be intermediate mid? How many distractors do we have in our program? What is it that we need to do with our textbook? Take a good look at the table of contents and say, OK, what function does that serve? Is that a priority for me? And I write textbooks. I can tell you that textbooks are a compromise between the publisher and the author. Let me tell you. <laughs> In my first year uh, college text, I did not want the subjunctive or the conditional. But the publisher said, the market has to have that. <laughs> they won't buy the book if you don't have that in there. And I fought and I lost. Because the market still looks at the little pet concepts. If it's not in there, oh no, I can't buy that book. So what do I tell you? If you use my book, don't use chapter 11 and chapter 12. <laughs> But see, that's what you have to do as a, as a teacher. OK, what function does it serve? Is that my priority? OK, it's OK to recognize it. It's OK to recognize it. But do I need to spend all this time manipulating if clauses when I'm trying to get them from intermediate low to intermediate mid? It's a waste of time. Question. Mm -hmm. concepts and how the students sort of infer. Yeah. How do you do that at, at the novice level without... I could show you. I, I would need two hours. <laughs> I could easily show you. Okay. Uh, but I need more time for that. Maybe I can answer. I can show you something after. Okay. All right. So uh, you, have, you have to think about what's your priority. And then you can see uh, the... Um, this is our 202, and if you, if you teach French and you want a copy of this, I can easily send it to you. Okay, what do we work on? And you see that in bold in the column on the, on the right. First, description, narration, in the present. Then all these literary texts, we handle it with that function in text type. Okay, then we go to questions. We don't stay there much. Then description, narration, in the past. And then we're going to stick in opinion and hypothesis because of the content. But then we're going to come back to narration, description in present and past for the rest of the semester. And we end up spending half the semester on narration, description in the past. OK. Now, how does that apply? Uh, I guess my battery just went out. OK, so uh, how does that apply to upper division content? OK. Um, I, do, I use it in my African Lit class, 400 level class. I use it in this is a, 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 an advanced conversation class that um, I teach for, to prepare students for the OPI because everybody has to take the OPI at the end of the, the major. And, uh, and that class fills up, even though it doesn't count for the major, it fills up every, every time because students know that they're going to make really good progress. This is for, to go from advanced low to advanced mid or advanced mid to advanced high. Okay, what do I work on first? Narration, description, and present with opinion. Talking about cultural texts and stuff. Then I go into narration, description in the past, using a novel as my content because it's action-packed and it gives us lots of meat to narrate and describe in the past. Then. The second half of the semester, it's all superior functions. Supported opinion, hypothesis, supported opinion, hypothesis, and recycling. Now, this is exciting. Okay, number two. Okay, uh, empowering students to communicate. How do we do this? We do it through pre-speaking. And I'm going to start with an example. Okay, again, that fourth semester class, because I'm focusing on that level because that's the transition that where so, so many students get stuck. Okay? Intermediate, intermediate mid to intermediate high to advanced low. We lose so many students there. They plateau forever. Okay? 
So let's say that you are in that fourth semester class and during the first part of the course where we're doing description in the present, okay, we read a text by Rabelais on uh, l'Abbaye de Telem, the ideal school in the 16th century. And so the logical follow-up is, what is your idea of the ideal school? Okay, without pre-speaking, you put them in groups and what are they going to do? They're going to make a list of, okay, so uh, we like a school with diversity, uh, no grades, uh, technology, okay, lots of extracurricular activities. Is that what you want? No. Okay, so this is very sophisticated, very. You draw two blank columns on the board. Just one line down the middle, and that's very sophisticated. Okay, one side is content, the other one is form. You do this in the target language. Okay, and so you start brainstorming. You say, all right, if we're going to talk about the ideal school, what's going to come into play? What kind of ideas are going to come into play? And so they look at you kind of puzzled at first, and you say, all right, you start the discussion. You say, what about physical surroundings? And they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have thought of it on their own. And so they say, oh, hmm, yeah, why not? OK, so uh, you start talking about physical surroundings. OK, here you have a beautiful campus, beautiful buildings, be beautiful grounds, the lawn. It's beautiful, OK? All right, is it important for your ideal school to have these beautiful buildings, the lawn? Most of them are going to say yes for the ideal school. And then they're going to say, oh, uh, what about having windows in the classrooms? We've got a lot of classrooms in the basement at BYU. And the students don't like them. I don't like them either. And so you ask them, why do you prefer classrooms with windows? They don't know. Never thought about it. And so you say, OK, let's think about it. Why? Cognitive development, okay? And so someone will say, well, it gives me energy to see the light from outside, the sun and the trees. It just makes me feel better. See, what is happening? You are doing advanced level cognitive development, okay? And then in the form column, you anticipate the mistakes they're going to make. And you talk about them. Okay, so the ideal school, and they talk about the physical surroundings, they're going to have problems remembering some vocabulary because you never recycle vegetation and uh, lawn and that kind of stuff. Never recycle those words. Okay, and some prepositions maybe, and some verbs in the present, and maybe you want to write a big because. Okay, I prefer classrooms with windows because. Okay. So uh, then you may end up with something like this on the board. That's just the beginning of it. Okay? And you write as they tell you. Okay? You, don't, you start with blank columns. And so what else is going to come up? Uh, probably curriculum, electives versus uh, uh, required courses, teachers, students, extracurricular activities, technology. You're going to have like eight categories on the left, and then you'll have a few reminders of either grammar, vocabulary, or connectors on the right. And then what happens is absolutely amazing. Because instead of doing those dumb lists, they're actually doing advanced level language. And what made the difference? The pre-speaking. Okay? You have in your packet the, uh, the example of Harry Potter. This is for, in 101, three weeks into 101. Okay? This is the task. You're a famous television, uh, television talk show host, and you are interviewing a famous character from a book, such as Harry Potter. Okay? Get acquainted. Ask pertinent questions on age, physical traits, personality. 
family and friends, and favorite activities, which exhausts absolutely everything they know how to do after three weeks. Use the French you know, and you'll have to report on your visiting celebrity. So I watched uh, one of my uh, student instructors do this. He showed this model. Okay? Even if you don't understand French, what level is that? What text type is it? Intermediate. Okay, are they intermediate after three weeks into French one? Absolutely not. Okay? But you technically they know how to say all those things. Technically. Okay? So you do the pre speaking. And in the pre speaking, this is what you will do. Okay, pour les salutations, formel ou familier? So, formel, so tu ou vous? You just write vous. Okay, pour la, uh, le nom, quelle est la question? So, someone will say, comment vous appelez-vous? You don't write it, it takes too long. Okay, you want to do this in five minutes. Okay, uh, pour l'occupation, donnez-moi un exemple de profession. So, someone says, engineer. So, you write engineer in the target language. Okay, then pour l'âge. What is it? What is the mistake that they will all make? They will want to use to be instead of to have. So you just ask them, which verb? To have or to be? Just because you ask, they remember. So you just write avoir, to have. Personal description for the hair and the eyes, to have or to be? Just because you asked, now they remember. Okay. For um, personality, give me some examples of adjectives. Because someone says uh, friendly, okay, funny. Okay, so you write what they say and you say to have or to be. To be. Okay, for uh, family, give me an example of family member. Someone says frère, brother. So you write frère. Give me an example of possessive adjective. Someone will say mon. So you write mon. And uh, then favorite activities, they know seven verbs here. That's all. So give me an example of a, of a verb for an activity. Someone says manger, to eat. So you write manger. Then you leave that up. And I've seen it over and over again. You have students three weeks into French one who are performing at the intermediate low level for that task. So what happens when you multiply the opportunities to perform at the next higher level? You get there faster. You get there faster. Okay. Now, uh, two years ago, one of our graduate students did her, um, uh, wrote her thesis on pre-speaking. And she and I are presenting at Actful in a couple of weeks on this. So she had 54 students. She divided them into three groups. She gave them communicative tasks three different weeks. And she rotated the groups. So one group was no pre-planning. Okay, you're given the task, and this was the first one. Okay, it's right after the, chap the chapter on the city and and uh, how to give directions and so forth. Okay, she gives them the task and cold, they have to do the task. Okay, second group, solitary planning. They have five minutes to think about it on their own. Then they have to speak. And she had them recorded on the computer so, so that she could get her data. Okay, then third group, Pre-speaking, with groups of about six, seven students. Pre-speaking. It was absolutely amazing because uh, as she did, the, did this three different weeks and the groups rotated, she found that no planning performed primarily at novice mid. Solitary planning perform primarily at novice high. Pre-speaking, 
they performed almost all of them at the intermediate level. And I've got examples of uh, their answers. It's absolutely amazing. Okay, so this is the model she used for that task with the pre-speaking group. Definitely intermediate mid, lots of detail. Okay. Then what kind did uh, what kind of pre-speaking did she do? Okay. First, okay. What do you have in a in a typical city? What are the buildings? Vocabulary review. How are those buildings? Review of some adjectives: old, new, tall, uh, short, uh, small. Okay. Then why are those buildings important? What do you do in them? Verbs. Okay. And then where are those buildings? Review of prepositions. She left that up, and you got intermediate low out of it. Six weeks into French one. This is what she found. Okay, no planning. They were able to speak in aver on average two minutes and twenty seconds, but it was a lot of uh, uh, uh. Okay, and I, it's words per utterance because they were not sentences. Okay, solitary. A little shorter, but they were able to say more. Okay? Free speaking, look at the length. Look at the length. With pre speaking, they were able to speak for four minutes and 31 seconds average for that task. And you can see you can see the rest. Okay, and she also measured their accuracy and so forth. Okay, and this is the post study survey of preferences. Okay. 73% preferred doing the pre-speaking. And they all had the experience of each, each type. Okay? 65% thought that it really helped their fluency. 56% thought that it really helped the complexity of their answer. And 77% thought that it really helped their accuracy. Why? Because you anticipate the mistakes before they happen. And so what you have in, uh, th and this is uh, some of the conclusions in, uh, that she drew from that study, okay, there, I mean, it, it's amazing what happens. And so what, um, what you have on uh, the next page is a blank template of, um, on page uh, seven, okay, that you can use for any communicative task. Okay, and if you were doing a memorable vacation, then what's your function? See, that's what, you're, what you identify before the lesson as you prepare. Identify the function. Identify the text type you want to practice. Okay, what are the structures implicated? What is the vocabulary that will, you will need to recycle? What are the pertinent tools for elaboration? Okay, with a memorable vacation, probably they're chronological connectors will uh, be handy. Okay, and then follow-up task. What do you want to have them do to be, to show accountability? Okay, and um, then in the classroom, you do your two columns. Okay, and so if you were brainstorming about a memorable vacation, what would you say first? What? Okay, where? Okay, so destinations. Where are they going to make their mistakes? If it's in the past, Okay, they're going to have trouble remembering that getting there is narration, but describing the place is description. Okay, then wh where do they make their, all their mistakes in, in French and prepositions? Okay, so very quickly, very quickly. Okay, what preposition do you use with feminine countries, with masculine countries? With the, okay, then, uh, okay, places, what else? Memorable vacation. Activities. Okay, is that gonna give me an example of an activity on a vacation? Sort. Okay, snorkeling. <laughs> then is that gonna be mostly narrative or descriptive? The activities. Mostly narrative. Okay. So then, uh, people present. Is that gonna be mostly nar a narrative or descriptive? Descriptive. Okay. So as you identify the categories of ideas and then anticipate the mistakes they're gonna make then what happens? You prevent the mistakes before they occur. 
It's absolutely amazing. If we had time, this is what I would do. Okay, I would have you take a communicative activity that you're going to teach tomorrow and design the pre-speaking for it. It works for 101, 102, 201, any level. Even at the superior level, how to develop an argument. They don't know. They don't know. Okay, so the pre-speaking. And finally, okay, very briefly, since I only have five minutes, okay, working on text type. Okay, this will just be um, showing you what, uh, how to bring students from sentence level speech to paragraph level speech. What do you need? Increased active vocabulary. You don't go for the red truck the, at the advanced level uh, without vocabulary. Okay? Mastery of basic grammar. Not, not too sophisticated. Basic grammar. Connectors. Lots of work with connectors. And then practice giving details, which is cognitive as much as it is linguistic. So this is the first thing I do. I show them. In the, in the language, the difference between a, se a sentence level description of a family and paragraph level description of a family. And I have them do three things. Number one, circle connectors. So they circle the connectors. Then underline the details that are present in the column on the right that are not mentioned in the column on the left. What are the details that add richness to the description? And number three, identify the difference in sentence structure. What is the difference in sentence structure? And you have them do that periodically as you change topics, as you, as you uh, work with literary texts, and that, as you do some paraphrases of some uh, passages, do one in the, uh, at the intermediate level and have them turn it into a, an advanced level. Okay, so you do that activity, then you give them a bookmark with all the connectors, the major connectors in your language. Okay, and they pull that out anytime they want. I find that my students, I, I laminate it. I have it laminated at the copy center. They use it as a bookmark. I see them using it all the time. Okay, Then give them lots of activities where they have to fill in the blank with logical connectors and add any detail they want. Okay, And make sure it's on the test, too, because if it's an important uh, thing, it's going to be on the test. You have on your last page. Okay, page eight. Some uh, in the first box. Okay, example of closed type paragraphs, where you paraphrase a text they've been reading, and they have to add logical connectors. Or you can you have in box number two, from telegraphic style sentences to paragraphs. Have them work on that. Learning to organize. Then. Give them lots of practice describing, narrating, in orally, in writing. And for example, for this activity, describe your room. For each item you mention, give at least two or three details. And they think that's the hardest thing to do. How do I say three things about my chair? But as they do that, they're developing advanced level description, okay? And so you practice, and you practice for, uh, for uh, on the exams, too, okay? They, you give them quotes from texts you have uh, read and discussed, and they have to fill in with logical connectors and then explain what those quotes are about, okay? So, through the lens of proficiency, what will you view differently now? So I hope that you were able to get uh, uh, a few ideas that you can implement tomorrow.
These are very practical ideas that you can put into use tomorrow. And it was just a brief introduction. We would need like six hours to really work on it and, you know, bring your textbooks and, and create activities to go with, uh, with your textbook and call out the distractors out of your table of contents and do uh, a reorganizing of, of the, the way we, we approach things. But that's just a brief introduction. That's all I had time for. And I thank you very much. OK.